a full three years before a general election is expected, already political formations are starting to take shape, and very clearly so. There are signs here yeah, to show the revival of a party which used to be called URP. Yeah, we are not clear what the new name will be, but there's clear signs, very clear signs on the ground that URP is set to be relaunched. When it comes to President Huru Kenyatta's former party, the National Alliance, TNA, which of course merged with URP to form the current Jubilee Party, on that front, we no longer have just signs and indication. We have a solid party which has already been given an interim certificate of registration by the Registrar of Political Parties. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. The name of this new TNA party is, of course, Transformational National Alliance, which is a very clever choice, and I'll tell you why later on uh, in this video. Now, to some political observers, these developments may appear to be of little impact. One may say that they can go ahead and form parties. Elections are still three long years away. But that would be a very naive assessment, and I'll tell you why shortly. But in my view, the most alarming political development at the moment is the fact that there are increased calls by leaders for massive protests right across the country yeah, to hound the corrupt out of office. Why do I consider this development dangerous? Well, have you watched the movies where a brilliant mad professor creates a robot that they intend to control and then the robot turns into a monster yeah, that consumes everything, including the person who has invented it? Judging the current mood in the country, that is what calls for demonstrations yeah, would end up doing, in my view. Well, without wasting any time, Let's get down to it. Now, the interim vice chairman of the new TNA, Transformational National Alliance, is Abuana Cyrus Njiru. Yeah, he unsuccessfully vied for the Embu governorship in 2017. And of course, the party is linked yeah, to Gatundu uh, legislator Moses Kuria. Now, those who are naive will say the following. That party does not have Raila, it doesn't have Ruto, it doesn't have Uhuru. Chris, why are you discussing it? This is a party going nowhere. <laughs> hey, that is farthest from the truth. For many reasons. Number one, in politics, you never show your hand too early. Never ever. I keep on saying that on this channel. And let me give you an example from recent Kenyan history. Yeah. After the 2002 elections yeah, that brought Mwai Kibaki into power as the third president of Kenya, the National Rainbow Alliance, yeah, which was a coalition yeah, of the president's party, DP, Democratic Party, with Raila Odinga's party and others, collapsed. And as we headed towards the 2007 fateful presidential elections, Many people assumed that Mwai Kibaki would vie for re-election on a DP ticket, his old party, the Democratic Party. Meanwhile, a new outfit called PNU, Party of National Unity, was being put together. And everybody ignored it. Except the very few who understood that in politics, you don't look at things <laughs> on the surface, you dig deeper as deep as possible. Now back to the present, there are very many reasons, very many clues for people to take the new TNA very seriously. First of all, the initials are the same, yeah, with the old TNA. It's only that this one is the Transformational National Alliance and not the National Alliance. Including Transformational, yeah, in the name of the party, in my view is a very wicked, smart move. Why? Because we all know that transformational <laughs> is one of the 
very favorite words of Deputy President William Samoy Ruto. And so you can imagine yeah, that DP Ruto is trying to sell uh, a transformational agenda yeah, in his uh, presidential bid. But then one of the main people opposing him has transformational in the name of their party. So who's more transformational? The other key thing to note is that Moses Kuria hails from the president's constituency, Gatundu South. Now we all know that constitutionally, Uhuru Kenyatta is not vying for re-election for a third term that we know. However, let me ask you a simple question. Going into the next presidential elections, which will be the three major factors yeah, that will influence the results of those elections? Yeah, let's name them together. The Raila factor, yeah, because he has a lot of supporters right across the country. That may be changing very rapidly, even as we speak. <laughs> but for now, yeah, let's, that's a story for another day. Okay? So we have the Raila factor. We have the DP Ruto factor. Yes, he has massive support. Okay? And we also have the incumbent factor. Now, in a country like Kenya, where there's a lot of tribal politics, okay, the incumbent factor is very strong. Now, I can hear somebody telling me, but Chris, Moses Kuri will be the presidential candidate of the TNA, the Transformational National Alliance. He has already declared. And, of course, he's a non-starter. And therefore, this new TNA is a non-starter. <laughs> oh boy. We have said many times, people who declare their presidential ambitions early are usually fringe candidates. Yeah, with no hope of winning. Yeah, why are they declaring their intentions early? Because they want a place at the high table. Pure and simple. And by the way, while you and me may look down on Moses Kuria as a serious presidential candidate, the people on the ground have a different view. They look at him as a defender of the community. And they're bound to listen to him a lot yeah, in deciding who to cast their votes for. So Honorable Korea's intentions are very clear. He yeah, will align himself with another candidate. Because he cannot win the presidency of Kenya with support from only one community. And so he will align himself with another candidate who looks like a winner. Yeah for a place in the next government. Now what is super interesting here is that the reaction from the DP Ruto camp has been one of panic, alarm. More so because they also spirited efforts to revive the DP, yeah, the, the Democratic Party of Kenya. Former President Mwai Kibaki's first political party yeah, has entered power. And obviously the intention here is to take care of Nyeri voters. Nyeri voters tend to be a bit different from the rest of central Kenya. So why should the deputy president's camp be so alarmed at these new developments? Now, the deputy president also declared his intentions for 2022 very early. However, for very different reasons. He is definitely no fringe candidate. <laughs> like Moses Kuria, he's not. He's a major force. And to understand why these new developments of new parties in Central Province is very worrying for his camp, we have to go a little back. In time, year to 2013, shortly after the Deputy President was sworn in, because there's clear evidence all over the place that that is when William Ruto started thinking of his presidency or his bid for the presidency in 2022. He started developing key political allies right across the country and especially in central province and his master stroke yeah in ensuring that the central province vote is in the bag yeah was finalized during the 2017 general elections we all clearly saw what happened in central province yeah very popular candidates were locked out they lost the Jubilee nominations yeah, under circumstances that uh, were not clear. However, later on, a key, credible, reliable source from within the Jubilee party told the country what happened. David Murade told us on live national television that D.P. Ruto rigged in his people, 
here in the Jubilee nominations right across the country. But he singled out two areas in the country where this rigging was massive. Do you remember those two places? One was Rift Valley and the other was of course Central Province. Or to be more accurate, the Mount Kenya region. And so the DP hoped to sweep Central Province of the Mount Kenya region in 2022. How? By having his key people, people who owed their elections in 2017 to him personally, yeah, people who could not betray him, people who could not abandon him, because you don't abandon the hand that feeds you. No way. And it is now clear the strategy was to have these key people campaigning for him right in the grassroots. Yeah, and starting that campaign very early. So that by the time other entrants, yeah, other challengers start campaigning in 2022, the vote in this area is already locked in yeah, for the deputy president. That was the plan on paper. But now when other political formations come in, <laughs> they completely neutralize these plans. Why? Because by forming a party in central province, yeah, that will sweep the entire province. Because normally central province voters and Mount Kenya voters vote party rather than candidates. That completely frustrates yeah, his well-laid plans. Because it doesn't matter if you've been campaigning for 20 years, let alone five. Yeah, when elections come round, the voters in the Mount Kenya region, and indeed in many areas in the country, will go into the voting booth and vote for the party, the party that the community has selected. And if that political party yeah, has an individual who has a track record for defending the community, even by insulting others, then you're done. And if the president, yeah, shortly before leaving power, associates himself with that party which is most popular on the ground in his home region, then your hard work of 10 years is wiped out. That is really what it is. Now we have seen on several occasions yeah, young people dressed in yellow t-shirts, you know, and with a photograph of the deputy president <laughs> appearing all over the place to show support for William Ruto. Yeah. Now we all know yellow was the URP color. And so in actual fact what is happening here is that the party is being branded <laughs> before being launched or unveiled yeah, so that we all see what it's called. Bottom line, the groundwork for 2022 is almost being finalized very early, yeah, long before those elections. And it is something to be very worried about. Why? Because political battles have already started. You see, the allies of the deputy president domiciled in the Mount Kenya region are stuck with DP Ruto. It's already too late for them to change camps and hope for any serious support. And remember that the vast majority of them are Vifaranga the deputy president. Yeah. The way they got elected is that somebody sat at a computer and did pop, 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 duly elected. And so, even if somebody was slightly tempted to, um, to abandon the deputy president, they won't. They can't afford to. Yeah. So what will they do instead? They will fight tooth and nail yeah, to retain the popularity of the deputy president in the region. Yeah. Because retaining the popularity of the deputy president in the region means they will get re-elected. And if the influence of the deputy president in the Mount Kenya region crumbles, they're done. Most of these people would have had options if they are popular on the ground in their own right. Then they wouldn't have such serious problems. But when most of these people removed very popular candidates, yeah, in very suspicious, mysterious circumstances, then they have no options but to fold up their sleeves and fight tooth and nail for their very political survival. That is why anybody who wants to be very quick to write off the deputy president's popularity and influence in central province is being very naive. The man has his tentacles 
very deeply buried in the ground. Yeah. And therefore removing him is possible, but it's going to be very difficult. That's the truth. And I'm going to shock you. According to my research, if elections were held today, the votes in the Mount Kenya region would be split right down in the middle. Yeah, with the deputy president getting a half or almost a half which would still leave the deputy president well on course yeah, to being elected president. Because what you don't want as a presidential candidate is for the central province vote to go solidly as a block to your opponent. If you get half of it, then that's very good. Indeed, it is quite an achievement, yeah, a big enough achievement to land you inside State House. Now on to the calls by politicians for protests right across the country against corruption and against corrupt individuals. And the latest calls for these protests are from Kalonzo Musyoka, the Waipa Party leader, and Moses Wetangula, the Ford Kenya chief. Now we all know that these two individuals are struggling to get a foothold yeah, in the opposition in the country. Yeah, so as to be recognized as major opposition figures to fill in the shoes of Raila Odinga, yeah, who went into a handshake and is now in a very close union with the government of the day. A union that is so close that now it tends to defend yeah, even controversial moves by the current government. Yeah, a case in point, the Huduma number. Now I agree with ODM that it is laughable for anybody to say that Odinga has sabotaged the opposition. It is laughable. Why? Because nobody has stopped anybody yeah, from stepping into Raila's shoes. But the truth is, Raila's shoes <laughs> are way too big yeah, for, the, for the other minnows. I'm sorry, I'll just call them that because that's what they are. To be able to fit into those shoes. So the only way they've been trying to get traction so far is by criticizing Raila and giving the impression that Raila has blocked any opposition to the government in the country, which of, which of course is laughable. <laughs> Nothing like that has happened. The only thing that has happened is that there's nobody with enough clout yeah, to step into those shoes. In fact, it's very interesting because all the other so-called opposition leaders have been trying to ride on Raila Odinga's popularity. What they've been trying to do is what Mwai Kibaki uh, successfully did. In 2002, yeah, where he managed to position himself in such a place that Raila Odinga uttered those famous words, Kibaki Tosha. Yeah, and the election was over even before it started. And so clearly, what Kalonzo Musyoka and the Wetangulas of this world have been doing is riding on the back of Raila and trying to position themselves somewhere yeah, where Raila will utter those magic words. Kalonzo Tosha or Weta Tosha. Anyway, the big news is that finally, yeah, people like Kalonzo Msioka and Moses Wetangula yeah, have finally manned up enough yeah, to try and gather their own opposition support in their own right. And one of the ways of doing this is by reading the mood in the country and riding on a popular political wave. Now everybody knows the current popular political wave in the country is anti-corruption. And so Kalonzo and Weta recently told Kenyans that they're giving the president up to the end of May. Yeah. If key uh, corrupt figures are not behind bars, they will organize protests right across the country, from Mombasa to Western to Nyanza to everywhere. Now, politically, I see a major problem yeah, with this strategy, this new Kalonzo Musyoka strategy. And it is this, yeah, just do an experiment one day. Actually, don't do it. Just imagine it because it's very cruel. Take a bird of the air yeah, that flies and try and put it inside water. It will drown terribly. Or take a fish and try and get it to fly. The aerodynamics alone will bring it down faster than a stone. What am I saying? 
Kalonzo Musyoka has never been associated with protests. Yeah, in the few protests that he has taken uh, part in, they have been very safe protests. Yeah, and even then, Kalonzo Musyoka has completely looked out of character and out of place. The man is a diplomat. And trying to picture Kalonzo Musyoka leading protests successfully in the country is like trying to imagine a fish flying or a bird swimming underwater. And already this can be seen very clearly from their pronouncements. Yeah. When did you hear yeah, Ray Lodinga saying that I give so and so, I give the government up to the end of this day and then we'll start street protests? And that date is almost uh, over a month away. What the man on the ground sees immediately, yeah, the suffering ordinary Kenyan, yeah, who is listening to what you're saying, and it's ringing true as far as he's concerned, what he's seeing in you is an attempt to delay that uh, protest for as long as possible, hoping that you'll not have to do it. <laughs> That's really what it is. If you're serious with protests, you will tell people, starting from tomorrow, starting from next week, we're on the streets. Diplomacy and protests, peaceful protests, don't go together. But the reason why the latest call for protests is very worrying is that Kalonzo Musyoka and Wetangula are not the first to call for these protests, to remove corrupt leaders out of power. Very many other politicians have made the same call. And even more worrying, the president himself, in one of his speeches, said, or rather warned, that if the government does not handle yeah, the fight against corruption properly, Wanainchi will take the law into their own hands. Yeah, they will take over <laughs> that fight by themselves and go to the streets. In yet another speech, you'll remember, President Uru Kenyatta said that he has done his part. He's trying his best to do his part in fighting corruption. And he asked Kenyans to play their part, do their part in fighting corruption. So what did he really mean by Wanaichi playing their part yeah, in supporting the fight against corruption? <laughs> you interpret it in your own way. Yeah, but the way I interpret it is as follows. That they clearly come out to support the president yeah, in, his, in his fight against corruption. That they clearly show displeasure yeah, towards those who are blocking the fight against corruption. Yeah, or who seem to be blocking the, the fight against corruption. For instance... The judiciary yeah, for slowing down the cases or rather for not doing anything to speed up the cases yeah, so that these people are locked up as soon as possible so that corruption cases are concluded as a priority because this is a national issue. Now there's no way you can do those things yeah, without protesting, yeah, having a peaceful protest. How else can the ordinary one to do it? Yeah. And of course, this kind of protests would easily, very quickly, degenerate yeah, into an effort to physically remove a leader who is uh, perceived to be corrupt from office, physically. And that is where such protests would get dangerous. But my point here, and this is very important, looking at what the president has said in his speeches in the past, and looking at what his key allies are now saying, let alone, uh, leave alone uh, Kalonzo and Weta, yeah? it seems that the handshake team is at the very least considering yeah, a, a strategy to fight the deputy president involving the public, involving protests right across the country. And it goes without saying yeah, that protests to remove the deputy president from office would be nothing short of catastrophic because the deputy president has his supporters but it is also true to say that sooner or later something has to give yeah because the fight against corruption is slowing down considerably prosecution is taking too long yeah many of these corrupt people are fighting back yeah using their contacts in the judiciary using their contacts all over the place and there are clear signs that they are muddying the waters yeah, in order to halt this fight against corruption. For instance, recently we have seen reports in the media uh, indicating that some DCI, Directorate of Criminal Investigations uh, cases, are 
being controlled and directed by bribes. In other words, some of these officers are going to suspects and telling them, look, you're about to be arrested. Yeah, the evidence is this and this and that. Yeah, give me a couple of millions. Nimalize imaneno. Now, these alarming allegations are yet to be conclusively proved. However, my point is, the waters are being muddied. Yeah, and when you create such a confusion, such doubts about a key investigative arm of government, then you're well on your way yeah, to halting the fight against corruption. That's the truth. Because many Kenyans will not realize that even if a few DCI officers are corrupt, the fight against corruption can still be won. Yeah, because you do it the Singapore way. You make sure you arrest and convict successfully big fish, and I mean big fish for real. In Singapore, what they did, they arrested and convicted a cabinet minister. He was arrested as he was coming back into the country from a holiday. Yeah. And the jailing of that uh, very prominent public figure <laughs> caused massive corruption in Singapore to apply emergency brakes. That's how the country finished corruption. And in the case of Kenya, you don't need the DCI to be completely clean to jail just one cabinet minister. We call them cabinet secretaries these days in Kenya. Anyway, in conclusion, what I'm saying is that we're in a very dangerous situation yeah, because something has to give. And whatever thing will give may not be very comfortable for all of us. It could create serious chaos in the country. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekucha.